Before long, you would be a veritable reference book regarding those special places. Or if your sweetheart were waiting for you in some such place, you would do likewise. The whole thing lies in the degree of want to regarding the matter. Desire awakens interest. Interests employ attention. And attention brings use, development, and memory. Therefore, you must first want to develop the faculty of locality, and want to hard enough. The rest is a mere matter of detail. One of the first things to do, after arousing an interest, is to carefully note the landmarks and relative positions of the streets or roads over which you travel. So many people travel along a new street or road in an absent-minded manner, taking no notice of the lay of the land as they proceed. This is fatal to place memory. You must take notice of the thoroughfares and the things along the way. Pause at the crossroads or the street corners and note the landmarks and the general directions and relative positions until they are finally imprinted on your mind. Begin to see how many things you can remember regarding even a little exercise walk. And when you have returned home, go over the trip in your mind and see how much of the direction and how many of the landmarks you were able to remember. Take out your pencil and endeavor to make a map of your route, giving the general directions and noting the street names and principal objects of interest. Fix the idea of north in your mind when starting and keep your bearings by it during your whole trip and in your map making. You'll be surprised how much interest you will soon develop in this map making. It will get to be quite a game and you will experience pleasure in your increasing proficiency in it. When you go out for a walk, go in a roundabout way taking as many turns and twists as possible in order to exercise your faculty of locality and direction. But always note carefully direction and general course so that you may reproduce it correctly on your map when you return. If you have a city map, compare it with your own little map and also retrace your route in imagination on the map with a city map or road map, you may get lots of amusement by re-traveling the route of your little journeys. Always note the names of the various streets over which you travel, as well as those which you cross during your walk. Note them down upon your map, and you will find that you will develop a rapidly improving memory in this direction, because you have awakened interest and bestowed attention. Take a pride in your map making. If you have a companion, endeavor to beat each other at this game, both traveling over the same route together and then seeing which one can remember the greatest number of details of the journey. Akin to this and supplementary to it is the plan of selecting a route to be traveled on your city map, endeavoring to fix in your mind the general directions, names of streets, turns, return journey, etc., before you start. Begin by mapping out a short trip in this way, and then increase it every day. After mapping out a trip, lay aside your map and travel it in person. If you like, take along the map and puzzle out variations from time to time. Get the map habit in every possible variation and form, but do not depend upon the map exclusively, but instead endeavor to correlate the printed map with the mental map that you are building in your brain. If you are about to take a journey to a strange place, study your maps carefully before you go and exercise your memory in reproducing them with a pencil. Then as you travel along, compare places with your map and you will find that you will take an entirely new interest in the trip. It will begin by meaning something to you. If about to visit a strange city, procure a map of it before starting 
and begin by noting the cardinal points of the compass, study the map, the directions of the principal streets and the relative positions of the principal points of interest, buildings, etc. In this way, you not only develop your memory of places and render yourself proof against being lost, but you also provide a source of new and great interest in your visit. The above suggestions are capable of the greatest expansion and variation on the part of anyone who practices them. The whole thing depends upon the taking notice and using the attention, and those things in turn depend upon the taking of interest in the subject. If anyone will wake up and take interest in the subject of locality and direction, he may develop himself along the lines of place memory to an almost incredible degree, in a comparatively short time at that. There is no other phase of memory that so quickly responds to use and exercise as this one. We have in mind a lady who was notoriously deficient in the memory of place, and was sure to lose herself a few blocks from her stopping place, wherever she might be. She seemed absolutely devoid of the sense of direction or locality, and often lost herself in the hotel corridors, notwithstanding the fact that she traveled all over the world with her husband for years. The trouble undoubtedly arose from the fact that she depended altogether upon her husband as a pilot, the couple being inseparable. Well, the husband died, and the lady lost her pilot. Instead of giving up in despair, she began to rise to the occasion. Having no pilot, she had to pilot herself, and she was forced to wake up and notice. She was compelled to travel for a couple of years in order to close up certain business matters of her husband's, for she was a good businesswoman in spite of her lack of development along this one line, and in order to get around safely, she was forced to take an interest in where she was going. Before the two years' travels were over, she was as good a traveler as her husband had ever been, and was frequently called upon as a guide by others in whose company she chanced to be. She explained it by saying, Why, I don't know just how I did it. I just had to, that's all. I just did it. Another example of a woman's because, you see. What this good lady just did was accomplished by an instinctive following of the plan which we have suggested to you. She just had to use maps and to take notice. That is the whole story. So true are the principles underlying this method of developing the place memory that one deficient in it providing he will arouse intense interest and will stick to it, may develop the faculty to such an extent that he may almost rival a cat which always came back, or the dog which you couldn't lose. The Indians, Arabs, Gypsies, and other people of the plain, forest, desert, and mountains have this faculty so highly developed that it seems almost like an extra sense. It is all this matter of taking notice, sharpened by continuous need, use, and exercise to a high degree. The mind will respond to the need if the person, like the lady, just has to. The laws of attention and association will work wonders when actively called into play by interest or need followed by exercise and use. There is no magic in the process. Just want to and keep at it, that's all. Do you want to hard enough? Have you the determination to keep at it? A musician will note the slightest discord occurring in a concert in which there are a great number of instruments being played and in which there is a great volume of sound reaching the ear, while other sounds may be unheard by him. The man who taps the wheels of your railroad car is able to detect the slightest difference in tone 
and is thus informed that there is a crack or flaw in the wheel. One who handles large quantities of coin will have his attention drawn to the slightest difference in the ring of a piece of gold or silver that informs him that there is something wrong with the coin. A train engineer will distinguish the strange whir of something wrong with the train behind him amidst all the thundering rattle and roar in which it is merged. The foreman in a machine shop, in the same manner, detects the little strange noise that informs him that something is amiss, and he rings off the power at once. Telegraphers are able to detect the almost imperceptible differences in the sound of their instruments that informs them that a new operator is on the wire, or just who is sending the message, and in some cases, the mood or temper of the person transmitting it. Trainmen and steamboatmen recognize the differences between every engine or boat in their line or river as the case may be. A skilled physician will detect the faint sounds denoting a respiratory trouble or a heart murmur in the patients. And yet these very people who are able to detect the faint differences in sound above mentioned are often known as poor hearers in other things. Why? simply because they hear only that in which they are interested and to which their attention has been directed. That is the whole secret, and in it is also to be found the secret of training of the ear perception. It is all a matter of interest and attention. The details depend upon these principles. In view of the facts just stated, it will be seen that the remedy for poor hearing and poor memory of things heard is to be found in the use of the will in the direction of voluntary attention and interest. So true is this that some authorities go so far as to claim that many cases of supposed slight deafness are really but the result of lack of attention and concentration on the part of the person so troubled. Kay says, what is commonly called deafness is not infrequently to be attributed to this cause, the sounds being heard but not being interpreted or recognized. Sounds may be distinctly heard when the attention is directed toward them that in ordinary circumstances would be imperceptible. And people often fail to hear what is said to them because they are not paying attention. Harvey says, that one half of the deafness that exists is the result of inattention cannot be doubted. There are but few persons who have not had the experience of listening to some bore whose words were distinctly heard but the meaning of which was entirely lost because of inattention and lack of interest. Kirks sums the matter up in these words. In hearing we must distinguish two different points the audible sensation as it is developed without any intellectual interference, and the conception which we form in consequence of that sensation. The reason that many persons do not remember things that they have heard is simply because they have not listened properly. Poor listening is far more common than one would suppose at first. A little self-examination will reveal to you the fact that you have fallen into the bad habit of inattention. One cannot listen to everything, of course. It would not be advisable. But one should acquire the habit of either really listening or else refusing to listen at all. The compromise of careless listening brings about deplorable results and is really the version why so many people can't remember what they have heard. It is all a matter of habit. Persons who have poor memories of ear impressions should begin to listen in earnest. In order to reacquire their lost habit of proper listening, they must exercise voluntary attention and develop interest. The following suggestions may be useful in that direction. Try to memorize words that are spoken to you in conversation a few sentences, or even one at a time. 
you will find that the effort made to fasten the sentence on your memory will result in a concentration of the attention on the words of the speaker. Do the same thing when you are listening to a preacher, actor, or lecturer. Pick out the first sentence for memorizing and make up your mind that your memory will be as wax to receive the impression and as steel to retain it. Listen to the stray scraps of conversation that come to your ears while walking on the street and endeavor to memorize a sentence or two as if you were to repeat it later in the day. Study the various tones, expressions, and inflections in the voices of persons speaking to you. You will find this most interesting and helpful. You will be surprised at the details that such analysis will reveal. Listen to the footsteps of different persons and endeavor to distinguish between them. Each has its peculiarities. Get someone to read a line or two of poetry or prose to you and then endeavor to remember it. A little practice of this kind will greatly develop the power of voluntary attention to sounds and spoken words. But above everything else, practice repeating the words and sounds that you have memorized so far as possible. For by so doing, you will get the mind into the habit of taking an interest in sound impressions. In this way, you not only improve the sense of hearing, but also the faculty of remembering. If you will analyze and boil down the above remarks and directions, you will find that the gist of the whole matter is that one should actually use, employ, and exercise the mental faculty of hearing actively and intelligently. Nature has a way of putting to sleep or atrophying any faculty that is not used or exercised, and also of encouraging, developing, and strengthening any faculty that is properly employed and exercised. In this you have the secret. Use it. If you will listen well, you will hear well and remember well that which you have heard. End of chapter 10 End of chapter 13、Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson。Chapter 14 How to Remember Numbers The faculty of number, that is, the faculty of knowing, recognizing, and remembering figures in the abstract and in their relation to each other, differs very materially among different individuals. To some, figures and numbers are apprehended and remembered with ease, while to others, they possess no interest, attraction, or affinity, and consequently are not apt to be remembered. It is generally admitted by the best authorities that the memorizing of dates, figures, numbers, etc., is the most difficult of any of the phases of memory. But all agree that the faculty may be developed by practice and interest. There have been instances of persons having this faculty of the mind developed to a degree almost incredible, and other instances of persons having started with an aversion to figures. And then developing an interest which resulted in their acquiring a remarkable degree of proficiency along these lines. Many of the celebrated mathematicians and astronomers developed wonderful memories for figures. Herschel is said to have been able to remember all the details of intricate calculations in his astronomical computations, even to the figures of the fractions. It is said that he was able to perform the most intricate calculations mentally, without the use of pen or pencil, and then dictated to his assistant the entire details of the process, including the final results. Tycho Brahe, the astronomer, also possessed a similar memory. It is said that he rebelled at being compelled to refer to the printed tables of square roots and cube roots, and set to work to memorize the entire set of tables, 
which almost incredible task be accomplished in a half day. This required the memorizing of over 75,000 figures and their relations to each other. Euler the mathematician became blind in his old age and being unable to refer to his tables, memorized them. It is said that he was able to repeat from recollection the first six powers of all the numbers from one to one hundred. Wallace the mathematician was a prodigy in this respect. He is reported to have been able to mentally extract the square root of a number to forty decimal places and on one occasion mentally extracted the cube root of a number consisting of thirty figures. Days is said to have mentally multiplied two numbers of one hundred figures each. A youth named Mangiamel was able to perform the most remarkable feats in mental arithmetic. The reports show that upon a celebrated test before members of the French Academy of Sciences, he was able to extract the cube root of 3,796,416 in 30 seconds and the tenth root of 282,475,289 in three minutes. He also immediately solved the following question put to him by Arago. What number has the following proportion? That if five times the number be subtracted from the cube, plus five times the square of the number, and nine times the square of the number, be subtracted from that result, the remainder will be zero. The answer, five, was given immediately, without putting down a figure on paper or board. It is related that a cashier of a Chicago bank was able to mentally restore the accounts of the bank, which had been destroyed in the great fire in that city, and his account, which was accepted by the bank and the depositors, was found to agree perfectly with the other memoranda in the case, the work performed by him being solely the work of his memory. Bitter was able to tell instantly the number of farthings in the sum of 868 pounds, 42 shillings, 121 pence. Buxton mentally calculated the number of cubical eighths of an inch there were in a quadrangular mass 23,145,789 yards long, 2,642,732 yards wide, and 54,965 yards in thickness. He also figured out mentally the dimensions of an irregular estate of about a thousand acres, giving the contents in acres and perches, then reducing them to square inches, and then reducing them to square hairbreadths, estimating 2,304 to the square inch, 48 to each side. The mathematical prodigy, Zira Colburn, was perhaps the most remarkable of any of these remarkable people. When a mere child, he began to develop the most amazing qualities of mind regarding figures, he was able to instantly make the mental calculation of the exact number of seconds or minutes there was in a given time. On one occasion, he calculated the number of minutes and seconds contained in 48 years. The answer, 25,228,800 minutes and 1,513,000,000. 728,000 seconds, being given almost instantaneously. He could instantly multiply any number of one to three figures by another number consisting of the same number of figures. The factors of any number consisting of six or seven figures, the square and cube roots, and the prime numbers of any numbers given him. He mentally raised the number eight, progressively, to its sixteenth power, the result being 281,474,976,710,656.
Chapter 11 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 11 How to Remember Names The phase of memory connected with the remembrance or recollection of names probably is of greater interest to the majority of persons than are any of the associated phases of the subject. On all hands are to be found people who are embarrassed by their failure to recall the name of someone whom they feel they know, but whose name has escaped them. This failure to remember the names of persons undoubtedly interferes with the business and professional success of many persons, and, on the other hand, the ability to recall names readily has aided many persons in the struggle for success. It would seem that there are a greater number of persons deficient in this phase of memory than in any other. As Holbrook has said, the memory of names is a subject with which most persons must have a more than passing interest. The number of persons who never or rarely forget a name is exceedingly small. The number of those who have a poor memory for them is very large. The reason for this is partly a defect of mental development and partly a matter of habit. In either case, it may be overcome by effort. I have satisfied myself by experience and observation that a memory for names may be increased not only two, but a hundredfold. You will find that the majority of successful men have been able to recall the faces and names of those with whom they came in contact, and it is an interesting subject for speculation as to just how much of their success was due to this faculty. Socrates is said to have easily remembered the names of all of his students, and his classes numbered thousands in the course of a year. Xenophon is said to have known the name of every one of his soldiers, which faculty was shared by Washington and Napoleon also. Trajan is said to have known the names of all of the Praetorian guards, numbering about 12,000. Pericles knew the face and name of every one of the citizens of Athens. Cineus is said to have known the names of all of the citizens of Rome. Themistocles knew the names of 20,000 Athenians. Lucius Scipio could call by name every citizen of Rome. John Wesley could recall the names of thousands of persons whom he had met in his travels. Henry Clay was specially developed in this phase of memory, and there was a tradition among his followers that he remembered every one whom he met. Blaine had a similar reputation. There have been many theories advanced and explanations offered to account for the fact that the recollection of names is far more difficult than any other form of the activities of the memory. We shall not take up your time in going over these theories, but shall proceed upon the theory now generally accepted by the best authorities, that is, that the difficulty in the recollection of names is caused by the fact that names in themselves are uninteresting, and therefore do not attract or hold the attention as do other objects presented to the mind. There is of course to be remembered the fact that sound impressions are apt to be more difficult of recollection than sight impressions, but the lack of interesting qualities in names is believed to be the principal obstacle and difficulty. Fuller says of this matter, a proper noun or name, when considered independently of accidental features of coincidence with something that is familiar, doesn't mean anything. For this reason, a mental picture of it is not easily formed, which accounts for the fact that the primitive, tedious way of rote or repetition is that ordinarily employed to impress a proper noun on the memory, while a common noun being represented by some object having shape or appearance in the physical or mental perception, can thus be seen or imagined. In other words, a mental image of it can be formed and the name identified afterwards 
through associating it with this mental image. We think that the case is fully stated in this quotation. But in spite of this difficulty, persons have and can greatly improve their memory of names. Many who were originally very deficient in this respect have not only improved the faculty far beyond its former condition, but have also developed exceptional ability in this special phase of memory, so that they became noted for their unfailing recollection of the names of those with whom they came in contact. Perhaps the best way to impress upon you the various methods that may be used for this purpose would be to relate to you the actual experience of a gentleman employed in a bank in one of the large cities of this country who made a close study of the subject and developed himself far beyond the ordinary. Starting with a remarkably poor memory for names, he is now known to his associates as the man who never forgets a name. This gentleman first took a number of courses in secret methods of developing the memory, but after thus spending much money, he expressed his disgust with the whole idea of artificial memory training. He then started in to study the subject from the point of view of the new psychology, putting into effect all of the tested principles and improving upon some of their details. We have had a number of conversations with this gentleman and have found that his experience confirms many of our own ideas and theories, and the fact that he has demonstrated the correctness of the principles to such a remarkable degree renders his case one worthy of being stated in the direction of affording a guide and method for others who wish to develop their memory of names. The gentleman, who we shall call Mr. X, decided that the first thing for him to do was to develop his faculty of receiving clear and distinct sound impressions. In doing this, he followed the plan outlined by us in our chapter on training the ear. He persevered and practiced along these lines until his hearing became very acute. He made a study of voices until he could classify them and analyze their characteristics. Then he found that he could hear names in a manner before impossible to him. That is, instead of merely catching a vague sound of a name, he would hear it so clearly and distinctly that a firm registration would be obtained on the records of his memory. For the first time in his life, names began to mean something to him. He paid attention to every name he heard, just as he did to every note he handled. He would repeat a name to himself after hearing it, and would thus strengthen the impression. If he came across an unusual name, he would write it down several times at the first opportunity, thus obtaining the benefit of a double sense impression, adding eye impression or ear impression. All this, of course, aroused his interest in the subject of names in general, which led him to the next step in his progress. Mr. X then began to study names, their origin, their peculiarities, their differences, points of resemblances, etc. He made a hobby of names and evinced all the joy of a collector when he was able to stick the pins of attention through the specimen of a new and unfamiliar species of name. He began to collect names, just as others collect beetles, stamps, coins, etc., and took quite a pride in his collection and in his knowledge of the subject. He read books on names from the libraries, giving their origin, etc. He had the Dickens delight in queer names, and would amuse his friends by relating the funny names he had seen on signs and otherwise. He took a small city directory home with him, and would run over the pages in the evening, looking up new names and classifying old ones into groups. He found that some names were derived from animals, and put these into a class by themselves. The lions, wolves, foxes, lambs, hares, etc. Others were put into color group, blacks, 
greens, whites, grays, blues, etc. Others belong to the bird family. Crows, hawks, birds, drakes, cranes, doves, jays, etc. Others belong to trades. Millers, smiths, coopers, malsters, carpenters, bakers, painters, etc. It is all a matter of attention, interest, natural or induced, and practice. Begin with a set of dominoes, if you like, and try to remember the spots on one of them rapidly glanced at, then two, then three. By increasing the number gradually, you will attain a power of perception and a memory of sight impressions that will appear almost marvelous. And not only will you begin to remember dominoes, but you will also be able to perceive and remember thousands of little details of interest in everything that have heretofore escaped your notice. The principle is very simple, but the results that may be obtained by practice are wonderful. The trouble with most of you is that you have been looking without seeing, gazing but not observing. The objects around you have been out of your mental focus. If you will but change your mental focus by means of will and attention, you will be able to cure yourself of the careless methods of seeing and observing that have been hindrances to your success. You have been blaming it on your memory, but the fault is with your perception. How can the memory remember when it is not given anything in the way of clear impressions? You have been like young infants in this matter. Now it is time for you to begin to sit up and take notice, no matter how old you may be. The whole thing in a nutshell is this. In order to remember the things that pass before your sight, you must begin to see with your mind instead of with your retina. Let the impression get beyond your retina and into your mind. If you will do this, you will find that memory will do the rest. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 10 – Training the Ear The sense of hearing is one of the highest of the senses, or channels, whereby we receive impressions from the outside world. In fact, it ranks almost as high as the sense of sight. In the senses of taste, touch, and smell, there is a direct contact between the sensitive recipient nerve substance and the particles of the object sensed, while in the sense of sight and the sense of hearing, the impression is received through the medium of waves in the ether, in the case of sight, or waves in the air, in the sense of hearing. Moreover, in taste, smell, and touch, the objects sensed are brought into direct contact with the terminal nerve apparatus, while in seeing and hearing, the nerves terminate in peculiar and delicate sacs, which contain a fluidic substance through which the impression is conveyed to the nerve proper. Loss of this fluidic substance destroys the faculty to receive impressions and deafness or blindness ensues. As Foster says, waves of sound falling upon the auditory nerve itself produces no effect whatever. It is only when, by the medium of the endolymph, they are brought to bear on the delicate and peculiar epithelium cells which constitute the peripheral terminations of the nerve that sensations of sound arise. Just as it is true that it is the mind and not the eye that really sees, so it is true that it is the mind and not the ear that really hears. Many sounds reach the ear that are not registered by the mind. We pass along a crowded street, the waves of many sounds reaching the nerves of the ear, and yet the mind accepts the sounds of but few things, 
particularly when the novelty of the sounds has passed away. It is a matter of interest and attention in this case as well as in the case of hearing. As Halleck says, if we sit by an open window in the country on a summer day, we may have many stimuli knocking at the gate of attention, the ticking of a clock, the sound of the wind, the cackling of fowl, the quacking of ducks, the barking of dogs, the lowing of cows, the cries of children at play, the rustling of leaves, the songs of birds, the rumbling of wagons, etc. If attention is centered upon any one of these, that, for the time being, acquires the importance of a king upon the throne of our mental world. Many persons complain of not being able to remember sounds or things reaching the mind through the sense of hearing and attribute the trouble to some defect in the organs of hearing. But in so doing, they overlook the real cause of the trouble, for it is a scientific fact that many of such persons are found to have hearing apparatus perfectly developed and in the best working order their trouble arising from a lack of training of the mental faculty of hearing. In other words, the trouble is in their mind instead of in the organs of hearing. To acquire the faculty of correct hearing and correct memory of things heard, the mental faculty of hearing must be exercised, trained, and developed. Given a number of people whose hearing apparatus are equally perfect, we will find that some hear much better than others, and some hear certain things better than they do certain other things, and that there is a great difference in the grades and degrees of memory of things heard. As Kay says, great differences exist among individuals with regard to the acuteness of this sense, hearing, and some possess it in greater perfection in certain directions than in others. One whose hearing is good for sound in general may yet have but little ear for musical notes, and, on the other hand, one with a good ear for music may yet be deficient as regards hearing in general. The secret of this is to be found in the degree of interest and attention bestowed upon the particular thing giving forth the sound. It is a fact that the mind will hear the faintest sounds from things in which is centered interest and attention, while at the same time ignoring things in which there is no interest and to which the attention is not turned. A sleeping mother will awaken at the slightest whimper from her babe, while the rumbling of a heavy wagon on the street or even the discharge of a gun in the neighborhood may not be noticed by her. An engineer will detect the slightest difference in the whir or hum of his engine, while failing to notice a very loud noise outside. Others were trees, chestnuts, oak leaves, walnuts, cherries, pines, etc. Then there were hills and dales, fields and mountains, lanes and brooks. Some were strong, others were gay others were savage, others noble, and so on. It would take a whole book to tell you what the man found out about names. He came near becoming a crank on the subject, but his hobby began to manifest excellent results, for his interest had been awakened to an unusual degree, and he was becoming very proficient in his recollection of names, for they now meant something to him. He easily recalled all the regular customers at his bank, quite a number by the way, for the bank was a large one, and many occasional depositors were delighted to have themselves called by name by our friend. Occasionally he would meet with a name that balked him, in which case he would repeat it over to himself and write it a number of times until he had mastered it. After that it never escaped him. Mr. X would always repeat a name when it was spoken and would at the same time look intently at the person bearing it, thus seeming to fix the two together in his mind at the same time. When he wanted them, they would be found in each other's company. He also acquired the habit of visualizing the name, 
that is, he would see its letters in his mind's eye as a picture. This he regarded as a most important point, and we thoroughly agree with him. He used the law of association in the direction of associating a new man with a well-remembered man of the same name. A new Mr. Schmitzenberger would be associated with an old customer of the same name. When he would see the new man, he would think of the old one, and the name would flash into his mind. To sum up the whole method, however, it may be said that the gist of the thing was in taking an interest in names in general. In this way, an uninteresting subject was made interesting, and a man always has a good memory for the things in which he is interested. The case of Mr. X is an extreme one, and the results obtained were beyond the ordinary. But if you will take a leaf from his book, you may obtain the same results in the degree that you work for it. Make a study of names, start a collection, and you will have no trouble in developing a memory for them. This is the whole thing in a nutshell. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 12 – How to Remember Faces The memory of faces is closely connected with the memory of names and yet the two are not always associated, for there are many people who easily remember faces and yet forget names, and vice versa. In some ways, however, the memory of faces is a necessary precedent for the recollection of the names of people. For unless we recall the face, we are unable to make the necessary association with the name of the person. We have given a number of instances of face memory in our chapter on name memory in which are given instances of the wonderful memory of celebrated individuals who acquired a knowledge and memory of the thousands of citizens of a town or city or the soldiers of an army. In this chapter, however, we shall pay attention only to the subject of the recollection of the features of persons, irrespective of their names. This faculty is possessed by all persons, but in varying degrees. Those in whom it is well developed seem to recognize the faces of persons whom they have met years before, and to associate them with their circumstances in which they last met them, even where the name escapes the memory. Others seem to forget a face the moment it passes from view, and fail to recognize the same persons whom they met only a few hours before much to their mortification and chagrin. Detectives, newspaper reporters, and others who come in contact with many people usually have this faculty largely developed, for it becomes a necessity of their work, and their interest and attention is rendered active thereby. Public men often have this faculty largely developed by reason of the necessities of their life. It is said that James G. Blaine never forgot the face of anyone whom he had met and conversed with a few moments. This faculty rendered him very popular in political life. In this respect, he resembled Henry Clay, who was noted for his memory of faces. It is related of Clay that he once paid a visit of a few hours to a small town in Mississippi on an electioneering tour. Amidst the throng surrounding him was an old man, with one eye missing. The old fellow pressed forward, crying out that he was sure that Henry Clay would remember him. Clay took a sharp look at him and said, I met you in Kentucky many years ago, did I not? Yes, replied the man. Did you lose your eye since then? asked Clay. Yes, several years after replied the old man. "'Turn your face sideways so that I can see your profile,' said Clay. 
the man did so. Then Clay smiled triumphantly, saying, I've got you now. Weren't you on that jury in the Innes case at Frankfurt that I tried in the United States court over twenty years ago? Yes, sirree, said the man. I knowed that you know me, and I told him you would. And the crowd gave a whoop, and Clay knew that he was safe in that town and county. Vidoc, the celebrated French detective, is said to have never forgotten the face of a criminal whom he had once seen. A celebrated instance of this power on his part is that of the case of De La Franche, the forger who escaped from prison and dwelt in foreign lands for over twenty years. After that time, he returned to Paris feeling secure from detection, having become bald, losing an eye, and having his nose badly mutilated. Moreover, he disguised himself and wore a beard in order to still further evade detection. One day, Vidoc met him on the street and recognized him at once, his arrest and return to prison following. Instances of this kind could be multiplied indefinitely, but the student will have had a sufficient acquaintance with persons who possess this faculty developed to a large degree, so that further illustration is scarcely necessary. The way to develop this phase of memory is akin to that urged in the development of other phases, the cultivation of interest and the bestowal of attention. Faces, as a whole, are not apt to prove interesting. It is only by analyzing and classifying them that the study begins to grow of interest to us. The study of a good elementary work on physiognomy is recommended to those wishing to develop the faculty of remembering faces, for in such a work the student is led to notice the different kinds of noses, ears, eyes, chins, foreheads, etc., such notice and recognition tending to induce an interest in the subject of features. A rudimentary course of study in drawing faces, particularly in profile, will also tend to make one take notice and will awaken interest. If you are required to draw a nose, particularly from memory, you will be apt to give it your interested attention. The matter of interest is vital. If you were shown a man and told that the next time you met and recognized him, he would hand you over five hundred dollars, you would be very apt to study his face carefully and to recognize him later on, whereas the same man, if introduced casually as a Mr. Jones, would arouse no interest and the chances of recognition would be slim. Halleck says, Every time we enter a streetcar, we see different types of people, and there is a great deal to be noticed about each type. Every human countenance shows its past history to one who knows how to look. Successful gamblers often become so expert in noticing the slightest change of an opponent's facial expression that they will estimate the strength of his hand by the involuntary signs which appear in the face and which are frequently checked the instant they appear. Of all classes, perhaps artists are more apt to form a clear-cut image of the features of persons whom they meet, particularly if they are portrait painters. There are instances of celebrated portrait painters who were able to execute a good portrait after having once carefully studied the face of the sitter their memory enabling them to visualize the features at will. Some celebrated teachers of drawing have instructed their scholars to take a sharp, hasty glance at a nose, an eye, an ear, or chin, and then to so clearly visualize it that they could draw it perfectly. It is all a matter of interest, attention, and practice. Sir Francis Galton cites the instance of a French teacher who trained his pupils so thoroughly in this direction that after a few months' practice they had no difficulty in summoning images at will, in holding them steady, and in drawing them correctly. 
He says of the faculty of visualization thus used, a faculty that is of importance in all technical and artistic occupations, that gives accuracy to our perceptions and justice to our generalizations, is starved by lazy disuse instead of being cultivated judiciously in such a way as will, on the whole, bring the best return. I believe that a serious study of the best means of developing and utilizing this faculty, without prejudice to the practice of abstract thought and symbols, is one of the many pressing desiderata in the yet unformed science of education. Fuller relates the method of a celebrated painter, which method has been since taught by many teachers of both drawing and memory. He relates it as follows. The celebrated painter, Leonardo da Vinci, invented a most ingenious method for identifying faces, and by it is said to have been able to reproduce from memory any face that he had once carefully scrutinized. He drew all the possible forms of the nose, mouth, chin, eyes, ears, and forehead, numbered them one, two, three, four, etc., and committed them thoroughly to memory. Then, whenever he saw a face that he wished to draw or paint from memory, he noted in his mind that it was chin four, eyes two, nose five, ears six, or whatever the combinations might be, and by retaining the analysis in his memory, he could reconstruct the face at any time. We could scarcely ask the student to attempt so complicated a system, and yet a modification of it would prove useful. That is, if you would begin to form a classification of several kind of noses, say about seven, the well-known Roman, Jewish, Grecian, giving you the general classes, in connection with straight, crooked, pug, and all the other varieties, you would soon recognize noses when you saw them. And the same with mouths, a few classes being found to cover the majority of cases. But of all the features, the eye is the most expressive, and the one most easily remembered, when clearly noticed. Detectives rely much upon the expression of the eye. If you ever fully catch the expression of a person's eye, you will be very apt to recognize it thereafter. Therefore concentrate on eyes in studying faces. A good plan in developing this faculty is to visualize the faces of persons you have met during the day, in the evening. Try to develop the faculty of visualizing the features of those whom you know. This will start you off right. Draw them in your mind. See them with your mind's eye until you can visualize the features of very old friends. Then do the same with acquaintances and so on until you are able to visualize the features of everyone you know. Then start on to add to your list by recalling in the imagination the features of strangers whom you meet. By a little practice of this kind, you will develop a great interest in faces and your memory of them, and the power to recall them will increase rapidly. The secret is to study faces, to be interested in them. In this way, you add zest to the task and make a pleasure of a drudgery. The study of photographs is also a great aid in this work, but study them in detail, not as a whole. If you can arouse sufficient interest in features and faces, you will have no trouble in remembering and recalling them. The two things go together. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 13, How to Remember Places. 
There is a great difference in the various degrees of development of the sense of locality in different persons, but these differences may be traced directly to the degree of memory of that particular phase or faculty of the mind, which in turn depends upon the degree of attention, interest, and use which has been bestowed upon the faculty in question. The authorities on phrenology define the faculty of locality as follows. Cognizance of place, recollection of the looks of places, roads, sceneries, and the location of objects, where on a page ideas are to be found and position generally, the geographical faculty, the desire to see places, and have the ability to find them. Persons in whom this faculty is developed to the highest degree seem to have an almost intuitive idea of direction, place, and position. They never get lost or mixed up regarding direction or place. They remember the places they visit and their relation and space to each other. Their minds are like maps upon which are engraved the various roads, streets, and objects of sight in every direction. When these people think of China, Labrador, Terra del Fuego, Norway, Cape of Good Hope, Tibet, or any other place, they seem to think of it in this direction or that direction, rather than as a vague place situated in a vague direction. Their minds think north, south, east, or west, as the case may be, when they consider a given place. Shading down by degrees, we find people at the other pole of the faculty, who seem to find it impossible to remember any direction or locality or relation in space. Such people are constantly losing themselves in their own towns, and fear to trust themselves in a strange place. They have no sense of direction or place, and fail to recognize a street or scene which they have visited recently, not to speak of those which they traveled over in time past. Between these two poles or degrees there is a vast difference, and it is difficult to realize that it is all a matter of use, interest, and attention. That it is but this may be proven by anyone who will take the trouble and pains to develop the faculty and memory of locality within his mind. Many have done this, and anyone else may do likewise if the proper methods be employed. The secret of the development of the faculty and memory of place and locality is akin to that mentioned in the preceding chapter, in connection with the development of the memory for names. The first thing necessary is to develop an interest in the subject. One should begin to take notice of the direction of the streets or roads over which he travels, the landmarks, the turns of the road, the natural objects along the way. He should study maps until he awakens a new interest in them, just as did the man who used the directory in order to take an interest in names. He should procure a small geography and study direction, distances, location, shape and form of countries, etc., not as a mere mechanical thing, but as a live subject of interest. If there were a large sum of money awaiting your coming in certain sections of the globe, you would manifest a decided interest in the direction, locality, and position of those places, and the best way to reach them, and gave the square root of 106,929, which was 5. He mentally extracted the cube root of 268,336,000, 125 and the squares of 244,999,755 and 1,224,998,755. In five seconds, he calculated the cube root of 413,993,000. 348,677. 
he found the factors of 4,294,967,297, which had previously been considered to be a prime number. He mentally calculated the square of 999,999, which is 999,998,000,000 and 1, and then multiplied that number by 49, and the product by the same number, and the whole by 25, the latter as extra measure. The great difficulty in remembering numbers, to the majority of persons, is the fact that numbers do not mean anything to them. That is, the numbers are thought of only in their abstract phase and nature, and are consequently far more difficult to remember than are the impressions received from the senses of sight or sound. The remedy, however, becomes apparent when we recognize the source of the difficulty. The remedy is, make the number the subject of sound and sight impressions. Attach the abstract idea of the numbers to the sense of impressions of sight or sound, or both, according to which are the best developed in your particular case. It may be difficult for you to remember 1848 as an abstract thing, but comparatively easy for you to remember the sound of 1848, or the shape and appearance of 1848. If you will repeat a number to yourself, so that you grasp the sound impression of it, or else visualize it so that you can remember having seen it, then you will be far more apt to remember it than if you merely think of it without reference to sound or form. You may forget that the number of a certain store or house is 3948, but you may easily remember the sound of the spoken words 3948, or the form of 3948, as it appeared to your sight on the door of the place. 